study through the book of Matthew. And uh, how many of you have been with us now uh, through the book of uh, Matthew, let's say chapters 1 through 23? Hey, you guys are good. All right. <laughs> how about 24 and 25? Yeah, most of you. Okay, well, hey, we've been studying through Matthew 24 and 25. Now we're finishing that up, and we're going now and beginning with chapter 26. And you guys know here at Calvary, we go through the scriptures line by line, verse by verse, and chapter by chapter. And so we're going to continue through now in our study through the book of Matthew as uh, Matthew presents Jesus Christ as king. And um, without further much ado, we'll just get right into the word this morning. Chapter 26 of Matthew, verse 1 and 2. Now it came to pass when Jesus had finished all these things, saying that he had, that saying, that he said to his disciples, You know that after two days is the Passover, and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. Now I don't want you to think that the, that the inflection in Jesus' voice is one like after all of these things he's talking about. And remember, it's been a heavy-duty time going through chapters 24 and 25, speaking about those questions that the uh, disciples asked um, of Jesus. You know, when will be the destruction? When will be the last days? What will be the signs of your coming? All of those questions, heavy-duty things. And then Jesus proceeds in 24 and 25 to speak to us and to speak to them about the last days, talking about the rapture of his bride, the rapture of his church, what those birth pangs are going to be like, leading all the way then into the description of his second coming, like what's going to be happening, what's going to be going on. We can all, you know, confidently say in our hearts, we don't want to be here at that time, right? Amen? We who are believers in Jesus Christ, we have a relationship with him. They, we will not be here, but we will be caught up with him as his bride, his church, he will come back and he will redeem his bride. In the air, Thessalonians tells us. But Jesus here, the inflection in his voice is like, after all of these things have happened, this heavy-duty stuff, then all of a sudden he doesn't say like, well, you know, I'm going to be crucified. I'm going to be lifted up. The Son of Man is going to be lifted up. You know, by the way, it's not the way it is. You know, at first when I read this and I was studying for it, I'm like, it's almost a parenthetical thing, but we have to understand what Jesus is doing and what he's setting up here because we are now approximately six days from the day of his crucifixion, from the time of Passover. And Jesus here is making a point, first and foremost. He says, you know, because he has told them about this. This isn't anything that's strange, unfamiliar. He's told them about it. After two days is the Passover, and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. Interesting, in two days, Jesus says that he will be crucified at Passover. Now we're going to read further on in the scriptures that the chief priests and those in leadership there, they cannot have that done. But remember the words of Jesus. Jesus is saying the Son of Man will be delivered up in two days, crucified. Verses 3 through 5. Then the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders of the, and the, elders of the people assembled at the palace of the high priest, who was called Caiaphas, and plotted, in, plotted to take Jesus by trickery and kill him. Verse 5. But they said... Not during the feast, lest there be an uproar among the people. And oh, I just noticed Christians here. Hey, guys. It's good to see you, man. Praise the Lord. I just said, oh, whoa, what are you guys doing here? Praise the Lord. Um, so back to the scriptures. Jesus is being lifted up. And in his lifting up, he's saying, listen, I'm going to be crucified. But we know that it says here, the chief priests and the scribes and the elders of the people, they assembled in the palace only trying to thwart the plan of God. Now, how many of you can really be successful at thwarting the plan of God? None of us. None of us can, nor ever will be, and neither were these scribes and leaders and Pharisees were they ever able to do that, nor the high priest himself, Caiaphas. They want to kill him, no doubt, because the scripture tells us in verse 4 that they plotted by trickery, to kill him. 
That's their goal. They want to kill our Lord. But they say, no way can it be done on the Passover. But Jesus is saying, quite confidently, he says, I'm going to be crucified on which day? The Passover. That is the plan of God, guys. For he, being that one true sacrifice, that one true lamb, and we'll talk a little bit about that, to be sacrificed, to be given up, that son of man, on Golgotha that day um, for us. Even if everyone in the entire world tried to thwart the plan of God, if everyone tried all of their scheming and all their planning and all their plotting and all of that stuff, know this, it would never happen. They would never be able to stop God's plan of the, in the crucifixion of his son, Jesus Christ, that one true lamb who would take away your sin and mine. No way is that going to happen. It would never have been accomplished then, and it would never have been now. Nothing we can do in our own power and strength ever could ever thwart the plan of God. You might think that, well, if I do this this way, if I do this this way, Lord, I'm tricking you. You know, I'm like doing away from what you want. No, God's plan is God's plan. And he will then conform you to that walk if you want to be conformed to his walk. He will ultimately do that. The only reason that Jesus ended up on that cross was because it was determined before the foundations of the world that this event would happen. That's the simplicity of it. It was already determined by God that it would happen. Nothing was going to stop it. I'm going to give you some scriptures here. Acts 2 through 22 through 24. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders and signs which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know. Him, here we go, him being delivered by the determined purpose and for knowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands and have crucified and put to death, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. Another verse, Acts, in the book of Acts, chapter 3, verses 13 through 18. You can turn there as well. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But you denied the Holy One and the just and asked for a murderer to be granted to you and killed the Prince of Life, whom God raised from the dead, of which we are the witnesses. And his name, through faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know, yes, the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. Yet now, brethren, I know that you did it in ignorance, also, as did also your rulers. Here we go. But those things which God foretold by the mouth of all his prophets, that the Christ... The Christ would suffer. He has thus fulfilled in Revelation. Revelation chapter 13, verse 8. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain. From where? From the foundations of the world. This was a plan ordained and orchestrated by God from the very, very, very beginning, before the beginning of time as we know it. It was ordained by Him. Then God gets many times even a little bit more specific. But when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, just I want to assure you of this, everybody. God didn't like go, oh no, what's happened? He didn't freak out. 
Okay? God didn't freak out. He didn't like, wasn't surprised at anything. He knew what, what was going on, and he knew then the plan that had begun ever since and even before their failure. And from Genesis chapter 3 and beyond to this present time that we're reading even today, there are many, many prophecies in the Old Testament concerning the coming of the Messiah, many of them, and the bringing of our Savior, Lord Jesus Christ. So I want you to know that this isn't just something that, that oops, it happened, and now God's got to backtrack and figure out, well, what do I do now? Now there's separation. What do I do? God knew this was going to happen. It also describes back in Genesis that Satan would bruise the Messiah's heel. Yet the Messiah, we know, would crush the head of Satan. We know that. The scriptures tell us that with his authority which is that which Jesus did on the cross. He thwarted every bit of the Satan's plan by his going to the cross in obedience and dying on the cross. That was it. It was over. No more victory for Satan. There's only victory in Christ. Then God, as I said earlier, gets even a little bit more specific concerning the death of the Messiah. Because remember, again, we're talking about Jesus prophesying his own death. He's saying, I'm going to be lifted up. The Son of Man will be lifted up and he will be crucified on the day of Passover. He's prophesying it. He's predicting that would happen. Well, it's also predicted or prophesied in Psalm 22, verse 16, where it says, they pierced my hands and my feet. And if you, do, if you want to do a study on 20. 20, 20, 21, and 22, and possibly 23. It's an incredible set of psalms which really depicts the crucifixion of our Lord and Savior. Already prophesied. You'll read that. You'll be blown away by it. It's like, man, this is exactly what happened. And David already wrote it down. Many times he's speaking of his own peril, his own anguish, his own things, but he is prophesying fully what happens to our Lord and Savior. It's incredible, those particular psalms. We know then that back, back in the time of the Old Testament, we even see Isaiah chapter 52, verses 13 and 14. Behold, my servant shall deal, behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. Just as many were astonished at you, so his vis visage was marred more than any man. And that's why when those of us who have seen even that movie, The Passion of Christ, and we see it and we sit through it and we say, man, that is just horrific. Some of us even like close our eyes and kind of, you know, do that number, you know. It's like I can't watch. But just know this, that it was prophesied that his visage, what his face was like, was marred more than any man. Just imagine that. Imagine what he did for you. What he took on himself for you. And his form more than the sons of men. Everything about him in the most physical that we know it to be, that we can understand, was horrifically maimed, disfigured, bloodied, bludgeoned, you name it, that's what happened to our Lord. It's already prophesied in Isaiah 52. Also in Isaiah 53, 2 through 5, for he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He has no form of comeliness and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we have been healed. Everything that Jesus endured everything that he did 
for you and for me. It had already been told. I want you to understand the gravity of verse number two here in chapter 26. This isn't anything that, that the guys, the 12, did not know of. But I still believe, and we, I think most of you can agree, they didn't understand the gravity of what he was saying. They didn't understand the totality, the finality of what Christ was saying as he's saying, I'm going to the cross. I'm going to get crucified. The Son of Man will be lifted up. Even in Zechariah chapter 13, verse 6, and one will say to him, what are these wounds between your arms? Then he will answer, those which I was wounded in the house of my friends. His brothers. If you remember back in chapter 25, Jesus was saying, if you do to the least of these, and he says, my brothers, speaking of his brothers, the Jews, he loved them. And he died for them as well as for you and for me. He died for all mankind. And it was to the house of his friends that sold him out for 30 pieces of silver. God knew all along, guys, what was going on. He knew all along what was happening and Jesus knew all along, what was coming to him. He knew. And here he himself prophesies that it will happen. It will happen. And it will happen on the day of the Jewish Passover. That's God's plan. Just as those prophets before him prophesied. The meaning of him being crucified on the day of Passover is that Jesus Christ, he, the Messiah, the one lamb, would be the fulfillment of the Passover. Do you understand? Because if we go back into the time of Passover, at the exodus of the Jews from Egypt, they had the Passover, that final plague that was placed on the Egyptians. God spoke to the children of Israel and said, listen, I want you to take a lamb. Take a lamb. Sacrifice this lamb. Spread his blood with hyssop over the lentil and the doorposts of your home, making sure that you don't put any of it at the base of the doorway because that's to signify the blood of the lamb. And you and I are not to trod nor walk upon the blood of Christ. You see, everything that is done and pointed to in the Old Testament, we see here in the New Testament being revealed. And that's why that mystery that was in the Old Testament is now being revealed in Jesus Christ. And that's why when he says, I'm going to be crucified, I'm going to be lifted up on the day of Passover, it's so significant. Because back at the Exodus, that was that Passover and the signifying of salvation. Because God had sent that angel to go over the land. And God said that when I see the blood, when I see the blood on your homes, I will pass over. See, that, that's what Jesus had done for you and me. When you and I come to the Lord at that day, he calls us home. He's not going to see Tom, but he's going to see the blood of Christ on me, on you. Because it is that blood as shown in Exodus that the angel of death passed over and God says, when I see the blood, I will pass over your home. When I see it, so when we go to the Lord, God is going to do what? He's going to see the blood of his son, Jesus, upon you. And then there will be no death. Isn't that great? For you and I who are believers in Jesus Christ, we have the blood of Christ on us. 
His righteousness we are clothed in, the Scriptures tell us. And it's because of that blood and because of that righteousness that you and I can stand before the Lord knowing fully we're saved because of what His Son has done. Because of His blood, not yours. Even we go back to the sacrifices in the Old Testament. That bull or that ram or whatever that animal is that is used. It was considered a substitution and a transference. You guys know, if you've been here on Wednesday nights, we study the Old Testament together. We went through Leviticus. We're going through Deuteronomy. We've been through Numbers. We've been through Exodus. We've been through Genesis. And we see in the establishing of the temple and those, those temple duties of the Levitical priesthood, we see that there's a sacrifice going on. That they had to sacrifice for an atonement of their sin. And that animal was to be a substitution for them. Substitution, be, why? Because you and I are supposed to be on the cross, right? You and I deserve death. You and I are to be the ones to have our throats cut. You and I and placed upon that altar of sacrifice. You and I. That's why this is so incredible what Christ says here. He is the one in substitution for you and for me. How does that make you feel? Are you like, whew, well, he's God. Of course he can do it. He's the Lord. Why shouldn't he do it? Oh, spiritual minefield there, guys. It should bring your heart to a place of humility and thankfulness that he is in substitution of where you and I rightly belong. Do you live your lives that way? Do you live your life daily? I'm not talking about sometimes just sometimes caught up in the day, but I'm saying are there times in the day that you can actually stop and you can say, man, Lord, I'm so glad and I'm so blessed that you took it for me. Do you do that? Oh, and it just doesn't stop there. It, it keeps going. It's beautiful. It keeps going because not only was he the substitution for you and me, we belong there, but the transference of your sin is placed upon him. That's incredible to me. Not only did God say, I'm going to send my son down and he's going to be dying for you, but also he's dying in your place, number one. And number two, your sin is going to be placed upon his shoulders. That's what it's about. That's what Christ has done for you and for me. And because of that, what do we do? What do we do then? Do we thank him? Do we praise him? I think many of us don't. I think many of us don't because we just get caught up in Christianity. I think we just get caught up in going to church, listening to the pastor preach. This isn't... Sunday mornings and Wednesday nights isn't what relationship is about. Yes, it helps us. And yes, we should not forsake the gathering of the brethren. And yes, we need to go to church and we need to be involved in, in serving the Lord. The scriptures tell us that. But your relationship doesn't start on Sunday morning nor Wednesday night. And end when you hit the 64 or the Route 60. Or when you get home and you again get caught up in the gotta do's, taking the kids to soccer, taking them here, taking them there, doing this and that. Where's your quiet time with God? Where's my quiet time with God when I get so busy many times in the ministry? And I've got to say, no, stop this madness. I've got to stop and I've got to sit and I've got to say, I can't deal with this anymore. I've got to sit with my Savior because what he's done for me. I belong on the cross. It's me. But Jesus says, no, I love you. And Jesus says, no, 
I, I take it from you. In bodily, physically form, and spiritually, your sin is transferred to me. That's the essence. That's the gospel. That's the good news, guys. And so, goodness, we, Jesus, in he being crucified on the day of Passover, elevates it to an incredible, astronomical, highly elevated place. I can't describe it anymore. It's out, it's out in the sky. He elevates the Passover to its highest and most perfect place. And that is when we give our lives to God. When you give your life to God, then as I said, his blood is applied upon our lives. And when the Father sees us, he doesn't see us, but he sees the blood of his Son, Jesus Christ. What does Jesus mean? Oh, it's his name. What does Christ mean? Oh, isn't that part of his name? Isn't that his last name? Jesus' his first name? Christ his last name? No. Okay? Jesus, Yeshua in the Hebrew, meaning Savior, Deliverer, or Joshua. Yeshua, meaning help of Jehovah. Help of the Lord. Jesus, that's who he is. Christ. Christos in the, in the Greek. What does that mean? It's who he is. Anointed. He's anointed by God. Jesus, the Savior. Jesus, the Deliverer. And he's anointed by God. Man, that is why, that is why he fulfills the Passover feast. That's the only reason. And, we, and I, I want you, I didn't intend to camp out on this as long as I have, but I want you to understand the gravity of what Christ says here and, and why he's doing it on the Passover. Because as death passes over the children of Israel in Egypt, so too death passes over you. It passes over because of the blood of Christ. The judgment passes over you because of the blood of Christ. That's beautiful. And if you're sitting here today going, yeah, I knew that. Yeah, I understand. I want you to do more than that. I want you to take it in your heart and I want you to start living it then. It's one thing to have a knowledge of what Christ has done for you, but it's another thing to start living out that knowledge in manifesting in your life. That's the important thing. That's what I want you to do. I want you to do more than just know it and understand it, but then I want it to take root and I want it to just blossom and bloom in your life outwardly. Judgment has passed over you and I because of Jesus and his death. The fulfillment of the scriptures, the fulfillment, ultimate fulfillment of Passover is shown and demonstrated in the cross. Incredible. Verses 6 and 7, And when Jesus was in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, a woman came to him having an alabaster flask, a very costly, fragrant oil, and she poured it on his head as he sat at the table. Now this place, Bethany, is like a stone's throw kind of to the east of Jerusalem, not too far of a walk. And the folks that lived in Bethany, as we read a little bit longer or further in the scriptures, we, we know then that it was um, uh, Mary and Martha and his dear friends Lazarus who lived in Bethany. Mary of Bethany is the sister of Martha. And so uh, Jesus goes to their house and he wants to have dinner. Isn't that great? Jesus is always about food. I love it. He's always wanting to eat and he's always wanted a fellowship and he always wants to, to dip in. And you have to get in the head of, of, a, of, a, of a Jewish person. All right? You have to get in their head. Everything they did was common, together. 
they, they dipped everything together. They ate of the same bread. They pulled of the same whatever it was, and they just were dipping, and it's like, and the idea was is that when I dip in this bowl and you dip in the same bowl, man, our saliva gets mixed in. Gross, huh? But it happens, okay? It's like my of me gets mixed into that bowl, you dip into that bowl, and now part of me is part of you, and part of you is part of me. That's relationship, and that's Jesus, and he's always saying, ah, let me suck with you. Let me sit with you. Let me, let me just dine with you. Because he wants that relationship and that oneness in your life. That's what he wants. And so he goes now to, to eat with his dear friends. But interestingly here in the scriptures... It says in verse 6 that they do it at the house of Simon the leper. So evidently, the house of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus wasn't as large to accommodate all the bros, right? All the friends, all the sisters. And so they move it to Simon the leper's house. <gasps> Simon the leper? Woo! Everyone's going to Simon the leper's house. No wonder he had a lot of room in his house, huh? <laughs> Who's going to go to his house? He's a leper. No, he's a former leper, all right? He's a former leper. Still the name stays on him, you know. But Simon the leper, man, they go to his house. He's got a lot of room. No one visits me anymore, you know. Come, Jesus, come. That's the heart of Christ. He wants to go to those who have been outcast by the world, outcast by family, outcast by friends, those who are not loved, those who are not understood, that's where he wants to sit. He doesn't want to sit in the houses of kings and queens and royalty. He wants to sit with you and me. That's Christ. So it's being held at the house of Simon the leper. And I want you to remember something here because... It tells us in the scriptures, as Christ knows in two days is Passover. In spite of all of this stuff happening in his life, in spite of all of it, you realize that Jesus didn't go once, but twice, but three times to the Father in the Garden of Gethsemane? And he said, hey, Lord, can I have this pass before me? I'm not your will, not, not my will, but your will be done, Lord. You see, not once, not twice, three times. Jesus knew what he was going to go through and what he had to endure. And so what's he thinking about? Let's have a time of fellowship. Let's get together. Let's go to Simon the leper's house and have some great falafels and have some great baklava and have some great vegetables and fruits and stuff. Let's just fellowship. That shows me something. And I pray it does you. It shows me the heart of a shepherd who wants to be around his people. In spite of what's going on in his own life, this is a heart of a shepherd, guys, because, and this is an example that, oh, man, Lord, I see here, and goodness, I want to be there myself. I want to be that shepherd that no matter what's going on in my life, no matter what's happening in my life, the problems, the situations, the circumstances, the, the issues, whatever's going on, I want to be able to minister to your people. I want to be able to be around them. I want to hang with them. I want to dip bread in the same bowl with them. Oh, I want that so much to be ruling in my life. This is the example of our Savior, guys. Your Savior. This is who He is. He's going to the cross in two days to endure the most incredible, scourging, anything that you can imagine. It's infinitely worse. Yet instead of him fretting and worrying and being anxious and closing himself away in privacy, 
I want to be alone. I don't want to be, I don't want to be around people because I'm going through this thing. Christ was going through a thing, let me tell you. Yet he said, I want to be with the people. I want to be with my brothers and sisters. There's no place we should rather be when something's going on in our lives personally than around brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen? I mean, that's the place I want to be. I want to be around you all. I want to receive encouragement. I want to receive exhorting. I want to, I want to receive love. That's what I want. When I'm going through a tough time, when I'm going through issues, when things are happening in my life that I can't understand nor comprehend, I'm just going, Lord, I don't get it. I need to be with your sheep, Lord. I need to be around them so that I can be ministered. I can assure you that only, not only did Christ minister, but he was ministered to by the love of his friends, man, by the love of his friends and family. It's funny. It doesn't tell us that his mom was there. It doesn't tell us that his brothers and sisters were there. It doesn't tell us anything. It just tells us that he was around a bunch of people, a lot of people. They, they probably were there, but you know what? I think the majority of the people were not family, but they were his church family. They were the ones that have been with him, the ones that have endured with him, the ones that have persevered with him, the ones that have been involved with him. Those are the ones at his side during this time. And he says, I want to be with them. I want to be with you, he says. That's our Lord. That's your Lord. Awesome. Awesome. So he's, he's dazed from this crucifixion, from the Passover. Then it says here, a woman, this being, and we'll go into a corresponding gospel that will show us. A woman came to him having an alabaster flask, and that woman is, is Mary, the sister of Lazarus and Martha. She has this alabaster flask and of oil, very costly oil. But I, I, I want you to notice something here. Well, everybody is going, eating and dipping and chatting and fellowshipping. What is she doing? There's something that she knew about. There's something that was sensitive to her that she brought this most costly alabaster flask of oil and breaks it. And begins then to anoint the head and the feet of Jesus. She knew something. Something divine. Turn in your Bibles with me to John chapter 12. John chapter 12, verse 111. John gives us a more complete or detailed description of this night. Then six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus was who had been dead, whom he had raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. Then Mary, this is how we know it's this Mary, took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard, anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair. Cool, huh? What worship? She was worshiping Jesus. And she took that costly amount of oil, which was, we find out later on in this, as we'll read, is worth about 300 denarii, which is equivalent to about one year's wages for a laborer of the time. Today, you might equate it to thirty, thirty-five, forty thousand dollars $40,000. What would you do? If you had something that valuable and precious, that was so costly, would you do what Mary does for your Lord? Three hundred denarii it costs. But you know what? This for this oil 
is truly the highest and the best use that it could ever be used for. It's for the anointing of our Lord. Typically, she would have saved this for her marriage. It was that valuable. And what's cool is that we see Mary this time and another time. This time, sitting at the feet, and also another time in Scripture. And this brings me just to a, a, a thought of like, are we like Mary? Now, guys, you know, okay, are you like Mary? It's okay to be like Mary because Mary had that desire and that love for her Lord that regardless of what anyone said around her, how they viewed her action, what she was doing with this costly oil, she wanted to love her Savior. She wanted to worship him. Do you have that kind of desire and love for your Lord? Do you want to worship him at whatever the cost is to you? Because this was a personal cost to her. And it says, and the house was filled with the fragrance of oil. But one of the disciples, guess who? Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, Why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? And he said, not that he cared for the poor, important to note, but because he was a thief and had the money box and he used to take what was put in it. Stealing from the money box. But Jesus said, let her alone. She has kept this for the day of my burial. For the poor you have with you always, but me you do not have always. Now a great many of the Jews knew that he was there, and they came not to Jesus for not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might also see Lazarus, whom he raised from the dead. But the chief priest plotted to put Lazarus to death also. I want you to know that if you're associated with Jesus Christ and people know, then there will be persecution in whatever way, I'm sure. If you are living for Jesus Christ, if you are worshiping the Lord, if you are giving whatever is costly to you, if you are willing to take, go out there and do it for Jesus, guess what? They want to kill you too. Simply. Just like Lazarus. Man, because he was raised from the dead by Christ, they want to put him to death also. Because on account of him, many of the Jews went away and believed in Jesus. Wow. You an example for Jesus Christ in your life? People will not want to be around you. People will want to persecute you. It's just a fact. It's the way it's going to be. And so, she has a sensitivity to Jesus. Even those disciples didn't. Because let's go back. Keep your thumb over or your finger or something in John chapter 12. Matthew 26 After reading in chapter 12, we see that the disciples were saying, now, wait a second, why would she do that? Why didn't you take this oil, lady, and why didn't you go ahead and sell it so we can give it to the poor? It wasn't only Judas, but all the disciples came in on the bandwagon. Because look at verse 9 in chapter 26. But when his disciples saw it, when his disciples, plural, saw it, they, plural, were indignant, saying, Why this waste? For this fragrant oil might have been sold for much and given to the poor. Now, in Jesus saying, you know, hey, but for you, the poor you have always, but for me, you do not have always. He wasn't being insensitive. He wasn't being heartless and uncaring. But understand when he says, the poor you have always. It's kind of an infinite thing. They're always going to be here, says Jesus. But me, I'm finite. I'm only going to be here for a short time longer. I'm not going to be with you always. There's a, there's a term limit on me here. And I'm going to be gone. 
the poor you have always with you. So if truly you have a heart for the poor, oh, guess what? You'll be able to continue to give alms and offerings unto the poor. You will be able to still do that. But I'm not going to be here for much longer. So that, that, see, that's what Jesus means in that particular statement. She has an incredible expression of love for Jesus. And as these, in verse 26, as these particular, or chapter 26, as these particular apostles, they kind of jump on the bandwagon. It's very easy, I believe, to jump on the bandwagon. Oh, look at the way that guy worships. Oh, look at what she's doing. Oh, man, look at that. And everyone starts to murmur. Everyone starts to come along with it. And yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very easy to get caught up in those things. And we have to be careful as Christians that we don't fall into that trap. If you are a murmur and a complainer, beware because what's going to happen is that definitely there will be a judgment because you then are infecting the others around you. And you're causing them to stumble. Something will happen, I know. Because your heart then isn't right. Are you always mumbling about someone in particular? Oh, this person. This person just bugs me. This person just gets my goat, rubs me the wrong way, goes against my grain. Not my grain, but my grain. Is there a person like that in your life? Beware of what you say. Be watchful of who you say it in front of because you shouldn't be saying it to begin with because that's a matter of your heart. And your heart needs now to be kind of realigned with the perception of God, not the perception of, of having a fleshly outlook. And then what happens, if, especially if it's a leader in the church, oh my goodness, a leader in the church saying disparaging things about someone, oh, what an infection that is. If any of the leaders in this church ever said something like that outwardly, oh man, believe you me, I'd be on them like bees to honey. Because that does not go here. Because it stumbles people. And it infects people. And it's a cancer within, within the body of Christ. We all have to be aware and careful of our heart and what comes out. These disciples, man, they've been with Jesus for three years. They love the Lord and everything. And even they are carried away by the comments of Judas, which tells me it's easy. It's easy. So you have to be on guard. You have to be ready. But what's the response of Jesus? Verses 10 through 13. But when Jesus was aware of it, he said to them, Why do you trouble, the, trouble this woman? For she has done a good work for me. For you have the poor with you always, but me you do not have always. For in pouring this fragrant oil upon my body, she did it for my burial. Assuredly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. <laughs> That's great. I love that. You think many times that, oh, it's the strong guys, the disciples, those guys that are with Jesus and they're just doing everything with Jesus. But here it's this woman. This, by their standards, in that time, in their culture, this simple woman who is not thought of higher than an animal. Jesus says, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. How beautiful is that? And you and I today, over 2,000 years later, we read the account of Mary and her costly sacrifice. I don't even consider it a sacrifice because to her it was probably just a no-brainer. I got this oil, no problem. Here I go. I want to anoint my Lord. Boom, and it's done. No second thought. Do you ever second guess things that you do for Christ? Do you ever do that? I mean, come on. 
I've done it. Don't show me your hands. Well, thanks. <laughs> In the back. But you, but you know what? It's like we second guess the things we're doing for God. Man, God, you've blessed me with this thing. Man, God, you've, you've shown me this thing. And it's like, and I go for it. I just, oh, maybe I shouldn't. Maybe, God, you've blessed me so it can be all for me. You know, all mine. But God has given a specific purpose for that item, for that whatever it might be. I don't believe that she even second-guessed God because this is something that she would have had for a while and or saved for and had. It could have been passed down from her mom or somebody, a gift. A, a, I don't know. But, but when the rubber meets the road, it was something that was very costly and meant something. And only things that are costly and mean the most to you and me when we give them over to Christ is what's most meaningful. It's what means the most. It's what makes the most impact to him and to others. You see, and that, that's, that's why I love this, what she's done. That's why I love this as using her as an example of how we are to have a, a desire and a love and a heart to worship in a most costly way. In a way that is most costly to us. Jesus said in chapter 12 of John, you can imagine this, in chapter 26, he gives the politically correct thing, okay? He says, why do you trouble this woman? But in chapter 12, he says, let her alone. Can you imagine that? You're sitting there. There you are kind of cajoling with your buds and there's Jesus, and he says, let her alone. <clears throat> oh, my goodness. You could probably cut the air with a knife. Jesus saying, listen, guys, let her alone. See, and Jesus is always defending people, is he not? He's always defending his people against unrighteousness. He makes an example of her, which I think is a beautiful example. He says, yeah, you, 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 you could have sold this. You could, have, you could have sold it for 300 denarii, no problem, given it to the poor. But guess what? You have an opportunity to anoint my feet. You have an opportunity to anoint my body and worship me. I want to encourage you guys this morning. Don't pass up an opportunity to worship Jesus. Don't ever pass up an opportunity to worship him. There are things that you will have always, things that will be around you always. But an opportunity to worship Christ in the way that is fitting, in a way that is the way that he wants us to worship him, that's a finite opportunity, I call it. And that's what was happening here. He had so much time left. He had a little time left. What an opportunity for her to worship him. He makes her an example to others. This is what adoration is, I believe. Not caring what, of what others say. Not caring about what others say. The way that you can desire to worship Jesus giving all of yourself to him, every bit of yourself, every fiber of your body, of your being, of your thought, worshiping Jesus, giving everything to him, no holding back, not reserving something back, regardless of the cost, you give to him what's most costly to you. That's the idea. That's the idea. What is most costly to me that I can give Jesus? Is it my time? Is it all the activities with the family and the children and all of this stuff? Is it what's even going on in my life right now? What's most costly? It's easy to give to Christ easy things that don't cost us anything. 
But when they cost us, that's what means the most. And that is what's the most lasting, I assure you. And it's not a sacrifice of pain, but it's a sacrifice of joy because you want to, because you desire to please your Lord and your master and the one who has gone to the cross for you in your place and who's taken on your sin. Gosh, is there anything that we have and possess on this world that is more costly than what he gave up for you and for me, frankly? No. Is this how you worship? Is this how you worship your Lord? I pray it is. Because when we do it with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, back in chapter 12, in those, those first 11 verses, it says that when she anointed the feet of Jesus, that the home was filled with the fragrance of the oil. It was filled with the fragrance of the oil. You just got to sit back and take it in. The fragrance of Christ. Wow. What a beautiful thing. What a beautiful fragrance. That's why even our prayers are a fragrance to God. Because they're from the heart. They're meaningful. They're important. And they're usually unedited. Unlike when we pray aloud. Sometimes they're the edited versions of, our, versions of our prayer when we pray out loud. But the unedited versions of quietness with God and prayer with Him, that's why He says it's a fragrance unto Him. It's a beautiful thing. He loves the smell of it. This oil had an incredible aroma. The room is filled with the aroma of oil. Mary wanted to spend time with Jesus. She loved spending time with Jesus, as did her sister and her brother, as well as countless others. And it's only in when you spend time with Jesus is when you walk away, you've got the fragrance of Christ all over you. You've got the fragrance of Christ that doesn't leave. You know what it's like. Going to a home, going to a place where there's like dead there's no fragrance of Christ. You can see it. You can smell it. It's just, it's just not here. You go into a home that is all in disarray and confused or problems or situations or whatever's going on, and there's like, man, uh, where's the fragrance of Christ in this place? Because it's so, it's so fragrant that when Christ is in that place, you can tell, you can smell. I like good smells. I like the fragrance of Christ when I'm around people. I don't like the fragrance or the stench of the world. But the fragrance of Christ, that only comes when you and I have been with him. Do you understand? Only when you've been with him in prayer, in devotion, reading your Bible, coming to church, fellowshipping with other people, other Christians as well. The fragrance of Christ overtakes you. It's almost a physical smell. That's what it's like spending time with Jesus. You want your fragrance to smell like Christ. Then start hanging around him a lot more. Start hanging around Jesus. Start praying. Start having devotions. Start doing your devotions. Come to church regularly. Wednesdays and Sundays, be with the body of Christ, the people who love you. And who want to exhort you and want to love on you and pray for you. Come and be part of the fragrance of Christ. 
You won't find it in the world, but you'll find it in the body of Christ, his fragrance, his sweet-smelling aroma. I personally think that God loves barbecue smells because of all the sacrifices he likes. Good old carne asada. Good old tacos, you know, or whatever. No, not tacos. That's pork, huh? Ooh, sorry. Fragrance, guys. Be smelling more like Jesus. Smell more like Jesus. Have his fragrance upon you. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for this portion of Scripture. And God, that we can see that through one simple act of devotion, one simple act of worship, one that was costly, Lord, was most important to you because it cost this woman, Mary, so much. But not to her. To her, it was a blessing and a pleasure to give unto you. May we always have that heart to give unto you in everything that you ask of us, God. Thank you, Lord, that as we see even in the scriptures that you are the fulfillment of the Passover and by your death on the cross, you, are, you have fulfilled that Passover, Lord that we are now covered in the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ.